The sun is shining brightly here in the picturesque Finger Lakes region of central New York in the tiny village of Watkins Glen. Once a year, the peace and tranquility here is shattered by the thunderous roar of race engines as the stars and cars of NASCAR come to compete at historic Watkins Glen International. For the third time in 2009, but only the second time in the 27-year history of NASCAR, rain forced a 24-hour postponement of the event here at the Glen. But folks, here's the good news. The track is dry, the cars are all lined up, and as you can see, the drivers are standing by as we are set for live Sprint Cup competition here on a Monday. And if what we saw last Monday at Pocono after having to wait 24 hours is any indication, this one should be fun to watch. So crowds are gathering on pit road as we get set to go trackside for opening ceremonies. Race fans presenting the colors today is the U.S. Air Force 113th Recruiting Squadron from Geneva, New York. And at this time, would you please rise and remove your hats for our invocation by Reverend David Fife from the Bentley Creek Wesleyan Church. Let us pray. Thank you once again, Lord, for this opportunity to run the hell of a good sour cream dips at the Glen. Thank you for the rain last night giving us a safe service. We ask your protection upon each driver, each crew member, and each official. Lord, grant us a safe race and help us to remember that all good things come from you. Amen. And now for our national anthem, please welcome Ms. Lindsay Gerhardt. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets regular the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled Despite the delay, good crowd coming back here on a Monday to watch their favorite NASCAR Sprint Cup Series drivers. And now the drivers will get into their cars and get cinched up and prepare for what should be an afternoon of exciting road course racing here at Watkins Glen. NASCAR Sprint Cup Series at Watkins Glen International is brought to you by Carfax and Old Spice Swagger, the scent that makes a difference. Teams are ready, so let's get some of the top stories of the day. First, here's Dave Burns. And, Doc, I have a feeling I'll be spending a lot of time in the Jimmy Johnson pit today. They qualified fastest on Friday. They're in the first pit stall on pit road. Those are both advantages that this team can use to give their driver his first road course victory. Jamie Little? Dave, the top qualifier in my section in pit road today is Tony Stewart. You know, he's a three-time winner here at the Glen, and he starts a lucky number 13. Darian Grubb, his crew chief, said these kind of conditions play right into Tony's hands. You know he's a road course ringer. He is the man when it comes to a track that is hot and slick like we're going to have today. We'll see if he can get his first road course win as a team owner. Shannon Spake. Jamie, I'll be keeping my eye on Juan Pablo Montoya and the 42 team, who are fresh off their season's best finish of second last week at Pocono. Now, while Montoya has been proving that he can get it done on an oval, some look to his past road course experience to make him a favorite here today. Crew chief Brian Patty told me this weekend they've been very happy with this brand new car, and while they're still searching for their first win, they're sticking to the chase plan, which is a top nine here today. Vince? 
I'll be checking regularly with the 47 of Marcos Ambrose, who starts fourth. His confidence is at an all-time high after winning the NASCAR Nationwide race here on Saturday, the second straight year in which he's won here at the Glen. Ambrose looks to turn that momentum from Saturday's win into his first Sprint Cup victory here today. He's been one of the best all weekend long, and Ambrose isn't going to make the chase, so he'll go for broke to make it to victory lane today. Doc? Thank you, Vince. Uh, the drivers are buckled up and ready, each believing that they will be the man here on a Monday at Watkins Glen. We have had 26 races at Watkins Glen over the years. There have been 16 different winners. Six of those winners are entered here today. As we get set to go trackside to get the command to fire them up. Race fans, it is time for the most famous words in motorsports. Welcome back your Grand Marshal, Mr. Scott Blake. Race fans, are you ready? On behalf of Hell of a Good and all its employees, drivers, start your engines! Just make sure it'll start as soon as it starts, just shut it back off. Yeah, I got you. Engines have fired and uh, the window that's going up momentarily. These cars will be set to roll off of pit road on what is the first of a couple of pace laps. Hello, everyone, race fans. Glad to have you with us. I'm Jerry Punch, along with Dale Jarrett and Andy Petrie here at Watkins Glen on a Monday. And we had, yes, a lot of rain here on Sunday, so all that rubber's been washed off the racetrack, a green racetrack, and it is also very hot and humid for these drivers, DJ. How must they adapt? Well, it's a completely different racetrack than what they've seen in their practice sessions, so that's what they're going to have to do is adapt to it. Probably not going to be able to get to that breaking point they were in practice. Just going to have to kind of take things easy here. They're going to be working, sawing the steering wheel quite a bit here. These drivers Drivers are going to earn their money on this hot and slick racetrack. And one thing that hasn't changed, it is still a 90-lap race, which means pit strategy and fuel strategy very important to calculate. Okay, crew chief, explain to us how you do that. Uh, the pit strategy on a road course looks very simple on paper. 90-lap race, and let's say you go 35 laps, which is about an average. That means you'll make your last pit stop on lap 55. And if you can go 35 laps, then you'll make your first pit stop on lap 20. Now, where it gets tricky is you get about twice the fuel mileage under caution than you do under green flag conditions. So the crew chiefs will be trying to predict just how far that they can go based on how many caution laps that they think that we'll get. So uh, that's where it gets tricky, and it gets kind of risky for the crew chiefs to make that call, but you have to do it to be successful here. Did you ever think in the second grade when they taught you to count backwards, it would help you be a better crew chief? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you got to do here at Watkins Glen on a lot of road courses, and we'll be riding along with this guy. What a special day he had here on Saturday and one year ago. Our in-race reporter is all. Australian driver Marcus Ambrose who came oh so close to winning this race last year. One of the favorite local landmarks here in the tiny village of Watkins Glen is the Seneca Lodge where race drivers would come after an event and stand on the bar and hang their victory lane wreath on what over the years has become a wall of fame. Many of those great drivers have come again here to race at Watkins Lynn. We have a star stud. If you look at all the champions, nationwide champions, cup champions, sports car champions, three drivers with extensive Formula One experience, two Indy 500 winners, and oh, by the way, five countries represented in today's field. It truly is Watkins Glen International. Our starting grid, and for the first time in his career, Jimmy Johnson on the pole on a road course. Now, starting outside of row two, our in-race reporter is Marcos Ambrose. Let's visit with Marcos. Hey, Marcos, Dale Jarrett, the ESPN. You have a copy? Hey, Marcus, uh, my first question comes from our ESPN mailbag, and Nick from Marysville, Washington, wants to know what lessons did you learn from finishing third last year, and how do you plan to win this season? Well, hopefully it'll be a lot easier at the front here just to look after the stuff. You know, we've got a great chance to win today's race, just like everybody else does. But I think it's going to be a lot easier to look after the tires and the brakes or not have to pass the whole field. The way the strategy works here, to start at the back, you've got to get off sequence, you end up passing twice as many cars, what you really want. But I feel like we're, uh, we're in great shape here. We're going to just try to look after our stuff early on and put ourselves in good position towards the end. 
Marcus, I've heard you say a number of times that you want to really be able to fit in with these cup guys. You seem like you're doing that. You don't want to ruffle any feathers. It may take ruffling some feathers to win this race today. Are you prepared to do that? Yeah, it may do at the end. Uh, obviously, guys like Jimmy and, and Kurt here in front of me, that, that they're looking after their chase spot. So I've got an advantage there that these guys may not be as aggressive uh, as I intend to be if it comes down to that at the end. But uh, right now, I'm happy with what I'm doing. The strategy I've had all season has worked well for me. I don't want to do anything different. All right, Marcus, thanks for talking with us today. Hey, uh, good luck in that quest for that first cup victory. And now Andy's going to talk to your crew chief, Frank Kerr. Hello, Frank. Andy Petrie up here in the booth. Have you got us? I do, Andy. How are you today? Uh, pretty good, Frank. We've been talking a lot about pit strategy, and this race really is going to come down to that last pit stop and when you make it. Tell us, walk us through how you make your decision on when to make that last pit stop. Well, you know, here, you know, you, you count backwards, you know, what you can do on fuel mileage. But um, like a practice error, you, you know, we calculate what kind of mileage we're getting but it's never the same in the race. So when it gets close to the end there for that last stop, we'll be calculating what we got on the first run, and then we're gonna probably plan on a couple cautions and uh, back it up a lap or two and hope for the best. Yeah, Frank, that's when it kind of gets tricky when you have to predict how many caution laps there are, but uh, good luck in today's race and hope you guys get your first win today. Okay, and thank all for coming back here today. It's gonna be a great day. It is going to be a great day. We will have onboard cameras in seven other cars, aside from Marcus Ambrose, not only uh, outside the cars, but inside the cars. We'll be able to show you the shifting going on for Jeff Gordon's car, the four-time winner here. We'll also take you into the floorboard of Boris Said and watch all the fancy footwork from one of the best on a road course as we ride along with Boris, who starts in the ninth position. This historic road course was built in the wine country of Central New York. Now, originally designed as a 3.4 mile layout for World Crest Grand Prix cars, it was shortened to its current 2.45 mile configuration when the stock cars began coming here on a regular basis in 1986. So let's take a look at these 11 turns. Yeah, let's go down into turn one first off. Uh, high speed, high braking area right here. You got to really be careful not to get into these cars. You can create some problems if you're not careful, Andy. Yeah, and one thing you're gonna hear all day long is wheel hop. That's a term we use when you really get on the brakes hard and you lose the rear tires. They start hopping up and down, lose control of the car. You see Jeff Gordon a couple years ago lost the lead on this move right here where he wheel hopped getting into turn one. Ooh, all too familiar with that one. As we head up the back straightaway through the S or through the S's to the back straightaway, very high speed part of the track. Really can't go too wide through this part. We'll see some guys attempted at times, but they really have to slow down. Now they're going up to the bus stop chicane where it's really difficult to get in another high braking area, but you have to be extremely careful here, Andy. Now, all the high braking zones are passing opportunities, and right here it can get real risky. We saw yesterday, or actually Saturday, in the Nationwide Series race, Marcus Ambrose made a daring pass on Kyle Busch in that bus stop chicane, and it came away with a victory, with Kyle Busch having to come to a complete stop in that zone. As we head out of turn nine over to turn ten, another good passing area, but you have to be extremely careful here. If you can get that inside groove on your competitor, you have a good chance at making a pass, but if you Get in there just a little bit too hot. We hear us turn, you heard us talk about wheel hop. Here's a great example. Yeah, here it is again. And you can see those rear tires just bouncing up and down. And when they're doing that, they're getting no traction whatsoever and no control. And you just wind up down here in the gravel trap. Well, you think you're about finished, but you've got one more turn to negotiate. Turn 11 seems to be pretty instant in itself, but we saw last year just what can happen with a mistake here. Looks like a speedway crash. Watch all of these cars get involved. You don't realize how fast the cars are going until they start hitting things. And you can see here, it's very narrow coming off turn number 11. This was last year, 11 cars involved in an incident that produced a 43-minute red flag, and there's Sam Hornish right into the barrels. Fortunately, he was okay. So much to think about on and off the racetrack, and how about the keys on how to be a maximum driver delivered by UPS? Well, we've been talking about pit strategy and identifying that pit window is so important in that strategy that you need to do that early. Uh, and also when to make that last stop. You use all the data that you've got, you make that last prediction uh, of when to make that stop, but then on these last two, I'm gonna need some help from the driver, Dale. <laughs> yeah, number three there, stay on the course. Utmost importance. It's really hard if you get off this course at any time to have a very good day. A lot of these guys, here, especially battling for top 12 positions, have to do that today. And then taking care of the brakes. We talked about those three high braking areas. You really stand on the brakes there. You have to be careful with them at the other parts of the track. 
Got to have so many talented people on pit road as well. And we've got one carrying a camera and microphone, a 15 year veteran and tire changer, Mark Hollywood Armstrong. He'll be changing the rear tires for Robbie Gordon at Hollywood. Uh, what are what are your biggest challenges on pit road today? Well, thanks, Doc. That could be the million dollar question today. I mean, it's a backwards pit stop, so there's nothing the same from last week to next week. You just got to pay attention, focus, but don't overthink this pit stop. Hopefully we're going to do two. We can do three and still win this race with the Jim Beam Toyota. But most importantly, don't make a mistake. You can have a great day today in the pits and go to victory lane. Hollywood, thank you very much. He's been doing it a long time, folks. He knows exactly what's at stake uh, when that car comes down pit road and stops. Very difficult. Backwards pit stop. The car comes in backwards. you got to count backwards to calculate your fuel mileage at Watkins Glen. Oh, by the way, they drive backwards here on this course. Back in a moment. Getting set for the start of the hell of a good at the Glen here. NASCAR Sprint Cup cars racing on a world-class road course on a Sunday, Monday afternoon. So sunny Monday here. It is a 90 lap race, 220.5 miles. The pit road speed 35 miles an hour. The pace car will run 40. In terms of Sunoco fuel, Andy, the pit window, this is critical. Yeah, that's what you can go, uh, what we predict the green flag pit range is, or fuel range is, but we'll see cars coming in uh, on that first pit stop a lot sooner than that, because like I said, they're gonna be working backwards. Don't be surprised to see cars on pit road at lap 20 or maybe even before. Let's check in with Dave Burns. And Jimmy Johnson getting ready to lead from the pole. His crew chief, Chad Knauss, had these words for the whole team moments ago. They were a lot of people making Speed on pit road, make sure he's clear, doing all that kind of stuff. That'll keep us here and get us in a solid top five here at the end of this day. The last time Chad told me they were looking for a solid top five was two weeks ago at Indy. Guys, guys, how'd they finish that day at Indianapolis? Yeah, I think that was a pretty good day for us. Yeah. It was a top five. That's yeah, a definitely yeah. solid top five. <laughs> and DJ, we talk about these drivers needing to get in a rhythm. How long is it, it going to take? Yeah, it's going to take a little bit of time. That's one thing. They haven't been in a car since Saturday, so they have to get back into that uh, mode of doing something that they don't do but twice a year. So we'll see a few mistakes here early on. And by the way, could we see a repeat of the contact? We saw at Sonoma between Jimmy Johnson and Kurt Busch. They start side by side in row one, and that contact cost Kurt Busch what he believes would have been a top three or four finish and maybe even a shot at victory lane. As our Brad Doherty said yesterday, we expect a wall-to-wall -wall brawl at Watkins Glen. He'll be pushing and shoving. Folks, glad to have you with us here on a Monday afternoon the world's greatest drivers in stock cars as we turn them loose at Watkins Glen. Didn't take him long to get three wide back there, did it? Man, look at Kirk Bush Kirk get Bush. the big run on the outside. Yeah. Yeah, he's able to clear Jimmy Johnson up as they start up the S's. Man, that was a power move right there. They took a lesson from his brother. He made that move in the nationwide race, Kyle did, and made a pass, and uh, looks like they learned something from that. That might let some guys look as we have double file restarts later on as to which side they're gonna choose. Ambrose looking to the inside of Hamlin will fall back in line. Looking out the front of Marcus Ambrose's car. Ambrose very good up here in turn nine. Yeah, he's not going to surprise too many with that move in that uh, chicane anymore, is he, after no, Saturday? They, they've seen that movie. See David Stremme there in the fifth spot, hanging on. That's where he started. Good run for those guys. He was pretty excited about his chances here. So he's taking a look on Ambrose here, getting into the left-hander. They have a hard time outbreaking him into that corner. As you can see now, it may cost him a spot. Yeah, Ryan Newman behind him watching Stremme make that move. And Newman trying to get a position away. One lap complete, and Kurt Busch is the leader. Kyle Busch there at the top of your screen trying to make a move. Yeah, he makes that fake to the inside. Now going to the outside of Ryan Newman. He'll follow Newman and go by Stremme in turn one. And you see Stremme get really wide there, trying to give some, some room as Denny Hamlin tries to put some pressure on Jimmy Johnson. Take away that second spot.
Johnson able to hold him off through the S's. Now here is the backstretch where he used it. I guess drafting does come into play a little bit here. Yeah, you can definitely use the draft. You're up about 180 miles an hour before you start getting on the brakes and start downshifting. So you can definitely use that to your advantage. You can see Ambrose, he just makes a peek every time they get to a corner, but uh, I don't think you're going to see a lot of aggressive moves this early in the race. I think the thing is that they, they just want to stay in line here, stay caught up. They're actually letting Kirk Bush get away just a little bit. He's got about a three quarters of a second lead so far. But Kirk Hamlin looking inside of Johnson. Yeah. It's like he's got uh, an opportunity to make the pass here. He's going to be in the wrong spot as they get to turn 11, though. If he can carry some momentum, could get three wide here down the front straightaway if we're not careful. Maybe Marcus Ambrose takes advantage of this side-by-side -side action. Ambrose, now who do you follow in turn one? Obviously, you want to stay on the inside. Yeah, but Denny Hamlin's made this work pretty well, and we saw Kirk Bush pass Jimmy Johnson on that high side. See if he's able to get off of there. Johnson's not ready to give that spot up here. This is pretty dicey going down into turn two, staying side-by-side. -side. Somebody's going to have to give here, and Jimmy Johnson is the one that gives. Pretty smart early in the race. Denny Hamlin won at Pocono a week ago last Monday to be exact by being aggressive and now he's aggressive in the early laps of Watkins Glen here is uh, speaking of aggressive here's Marcus Ambrose and he falls back in behind Jimmy Johnson. Yeah you see Jimmy Johnson making that defensive move to the right he did that early on before Marcus could actually get inside and that'll protect that uh, move from making it work getting into that corner. Yeah and what Jimmy was protecting from he was able to he he relinquished and gave that spot up to Denny Hamlin but he didn't want to give more than that because he had to get out of the throttle up through this as that gave Ambrose an opportunity to get a real run on him. So that's what you'll see these guys make that blocking effort. You see Kyle Busch in the 18 right behind the guy that passed him in the final laps on Saturday and surprise him. Let's see if uh, Kyle Busch is going to pay him back a little bit here. Uh, let's follow along and see if because Kyle Busch wasn't real happy about that surprise move that Ambrose pulled off on Saturday. No, but I think he understood it and I'm sure after he's thought about it a couple of days, hey, I might want to try that myself and then he understood a little more of it. He's got, it looks like he has a really fast race car here today. That's a good thing for him as he's trying to work his way back in uh, to that top 12 in the points. See, Jimmy Johnson struggling just a little bit. What are they saying, Dave? Right now, Jimmy reporting that the car is very loose. Crew Chief Knauss reminding him that the car does tighten up. It's always like this, but Jimmy had to give up those first two spots because of a loose race car. Yeah, we expected the track to be a little bit green when we started this race. And so the, you know, the crew chiefs and the drivers are going to try to have to be patient here uh, and let that transition happen before they make their decision on how to make that first adjustment. Thus far, everyone trying to find their rhythm and they have found it. We have not had an incident that the inner loop was a big concern. And now it is uh, Kurt Busch pulling away. Denny Hamlin in second spot. Johnson and Marcus Ambrose is running fourth. Vince. And as you mentioned, Marcos Ambrose trying to hold off Kyle Busch, who is challenging from behind. And the spotter telling Marcos Ambrose, use the whole track. Don't be defensive this early in the race course or in, in the uh, race. Run your race on the race course. So uh, Kyle Busch is pressuring, but Marcos Ambrose being Juan Pablo Montoya, there's the 42 car. Who he'd been trying to work on the inside of Ryan Newman to get the spot, and he will get it. That is sixth position. Newman back to seventh spot. We are five laps in of 90, which will comprise the NASCAR Sprint Cup race at Watkins Glen. Team Penske went to a couple of different road courses and tested. They wondered how it would uh, help their road racing. Well, I think we have an answer at least early on because it is Kurt Busch out front and he is pulling away as the leader. Bush, Hamlin, Johnson, Ambrose, and Kyle Bush. That's a top five. Back at Watkins Glen, Kurt Busch's interval now two and a half, 2.55 seconds between him and Denny Hamlin, the second place car. Jimmy Johnson back in third, Ambrose fourth, and Kyle Busch is fifth. There's a side by side move, and uh, what a surprise. Boris said the road racing expert making a move and getting by uh, Ryan Newman. Yeah, Ryan had run up uh, to about the fifth spot there early, but he started to lose some spots, so I'm sure he'll be some adjustments made on his car. Here we're right along with Boris said. Watch his feet. He's up through this. As you can see, you want to get wide open and stay there. He's going to shift gears there. They have a crash down in turn one. Bobby Labonte. Get it going. Get it going. Good hole behind the 34 right here. Right here. Go, go, go. No caution as of yet. We will stay green as Bobby slid off and now gets it back in uh, in line. Right behind David Reagan. 
Yeah. That turn one's a difficult spot during the race, no matter if it's a restart, after you run a few laps, and it, it actually becomes even increasingly more difficult as you start to lose your fuel load. Watch here, see, I don't think Bobby really knew that uh, Jeff Burton was there. It's really hard for the spotters to see a lot of these places, too. You have to position them around the racetrack. Yeah, Jeff Burton got a little damage to his left front fender, right front, uh, left front fender on that little contact. And here's a turn that's always an issue down at the turn one. Look at Ambrose looking that he will think better of it. Not only is it difficult to negotiate, but it's downhill. He's going to show Jimmy Johnson that move a few times. And uh, if he gets close enough, Jimmy will let him have that. He's not going to risk too much here early in the race. Let's go back and show you some of the footwork in the floorboard of Boris said. Now, Boris actually uh, teaches a lot of the regulars in oval track racing and spread cup how to become road racers. Yeah, you can see he's kind of feathering the throttle here. He's going to change gears here just a second. Right there's one. So he's up into high gear now. Down, he's not going to lift until he gets up here. You can see him tapping the brake, getting him ready. Now, heel and toe right here. Toe on the brake, over to matching up the RPMs as he goes through the bus stop. It's just great footwork. He uses his, his right foot for the gas, for the brake. Then he'll bring his left foot in here sometimes on the brake. You see, as he goes around turn nine, it's a place that you want to get wide open as soon as you can. Changing gears pretty late there coming out. They may change one more time. So you can see him getting his brakes ready to get into turn 10. Downshift. Just great footwork by uh, an extremely talented road racer. How hard is that to learn from someone that's been an oval track racer and's never heel and toed in the past? Well, a lot of these guys don't have to do it now. That's the way that I learned to do it. And, and uh, it's very difficult in these stock cars because you really don't have a lot of room. You're not stretched out. And talking to Boris and Ron Fellows and these guys, they have a lot more rooms. We see Montoya making a pass uh, around Kyle Busch to take over that fifth spot. But these guys, a lot of the guys now just use their left foot on the brake and uh, right foot on the gas because you don't have to do that with the transmissions, Andy. Well, one thing I saw in that shot with Boris said was he downshifting two gears there because he was going up two and you only saw really one downshift and I just wonder if he was coming from fourth to second. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that might be the, that's about the only way you can make that shift is doing that heel and toe type clutch move there. It, it makes it more difficult. Yeah, that's the only way that you can do that. So uh, we see Kyle Busch is falling back to the sixth spot. What are they saying in uh, Kyle Busch's pits, Dave? Why don't we hear it straight from Kyle himself? Here's his radio. That tight with the front is something they worked on in final practice. I talked to Steve Addington about it. He said he still wanted better turning from that front end. It wasn't terrible. We made small changes to try to correct it, but that's still part of the problem. Yeah, we saw what Kyle in the pre-race show yesterday talk about that was the one thing that he had been fighting with his cars. We see Marcus Ambrose here once again taking a look to the inside of Jimmy Johnson, but uh, hopefully that's something they can uh, adjust on a little bit more as the track uh, rubbers up some here today. You know, with Ambrose making that move and showing that front end on the inside, after what he did on Saturday and, and surprising Kyle Busch, everybody's got to think when he shows that nose, he might be able to pull that same move. So you got to be watching for it. Yeah, and you're really just trying to get out of that guy's mirror sometimes and make him think that and maybe he'll lift, but he has to realize he's dealing with a three-time champion right there that Jimmy's pretty aware of uh, where the guy is when you take off. But you can surprise him sometimes, just as Marcos did on Saturday. Car still single file up the back straight away. 1,800 feet coming out of the S's until you get to the inner loop. And the biggest mover early in the race, and maybe a bit of a surprise thus far, the 88 car, Dale Earnhardt Jr., has moved up eight positions all the way to 24 spot. And the junior is starting to get a little racy here, Shannon. Well, this is after a dismal weekend. In uh, final practice this weekend, Dale Earnhardt Jr. told his crew chief, Lance McGrew, that he had no confidence in the car at all. Lance McGrew told me that the car was really tight. So what they did was they just took the best that they could get in practice. They put a spin on it for Junior, and that's the way they started the race. Junior just radioed in and said that the car is loose. They've asked him to make some changes inside that car to try to fix it. A little bit of front brake for Junior inside that 88. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is starting to get better and better as the laps tick away. And as you said, uh, after a very tough weekend, now his uh, teammate at Hendrick Motorsports just lost a position here up in turn 11. Yeah, Boy, Ambrose is very aggressive on that move coming out of turn 10, which set up a great pass here in 11. Yeah, it looked like Jimmy got a little bit loose right here as he gets up on the, the rubber strips there. You can see Ambrose able to stay in the throttle. Jimmy, I think, at this point in time, just tired of having him right there. Clear, clear, good job. Uh, just uh, 11 laps into this Get race. Get your marks now. You're going to have a car coming out of the pits down there. 
So Kurt Busch a leader, Denny Hamlin in second spot. Now it's Marcus Ambrose third, and Ambrose was the fastest car in both practice sessions on Saturday. Everyone knows he may be the guy to beat here even early on. We invite you to round the bases with ESPN for two nights of Major League Baseball action. First catch Monday Night Baseball presented by Holiday Inn at 7 Eastern as Curtis Granderson, Miguel Cabrera, and the Tigers head to Fenway to take on Kevin Euclid and the Red Sox. Then on Wednesday Night Baseball presented by Spirit Off Ice, Ryan Howard and the Phillies face Alfonso Soriata and the Cubs at 8 o'clock Eastern time. ESPN News will be shown in both the Philadelphia and the Chicago markets. Riding along with Jeff Gordon, who started back in 31st position. He has made some progress. Jeff now being shown up uh, in uh, 26th spot. And I think these guys are still struggling a little bit, uh, even though he's made up five spots. I think we thought he might go a little bit faster towards the front, Vince. Well, this team has just, uh, as you said, they've been struggling throughout the course of the weekend. And uh, Steve Latart was visiting with him this morning. He said the real issue with him throughout the course of the weekend, they just haven't found that comfort zone for Jeff through the areas of the course where you really need to be comfortable to put a good lap time down. So they don't feel the pressure, though, even though they're not quite as good as they would like to be for sure. They're secure in their position in the chase. They know this isn't a race that's going to affect them to be in that top 12. So have fun, have a good day, and get out of here the best you can. So I don't really feel like they've got a contender today, but they're going to be aggressive on the strategy to try to get up toward the front. Jeff Gordon, a four-time winner here. His last win coming in 2001. But folks, in the last seven years, it's hard to believe he has had only one top ten finish here at Watkins Glen. Well, it was a mistake that took him out of the contention to win the race uh, two years ago. So he's had good cars, and I expect him to be into this thing uh, before the day's over. Just hard to pass. Yeah, here's, the, here's the one car, Martin Truex. His last top five finish in a cup car came here at this race a year ago when Dale Earnhardt Jr. will take advantage of the opening underneath Elliott Sandler to uh, follow Truex by. Yeah, good racing. These guys have been battling pretty hard for a few laps. Kurt Busch is the leader, but uh, don't look now behind him. Here is Denny Hamlin and Marcus Ambrose in the last couple laps, guys, both the 11 and the 47 cars are faster than Bush. And their lap times are almost mirroring each other while they're running down uh, Kurt Bush. Uh, and once they've cleared Jimmy Johnson, you can see now Marcus Ambrose has really pulled away. You can see how fast his car is. And he might not be happy with his car. Is that right, Vince? What's amazing is that Ambrose is so good when you're looking at the stopwatch and how quickly he's putting these laps down. But Marcos on the radio says he really feels like the car's too loose. He doesn't feel like he's got the grip that he needs. The front end is too stiff. They came back on the radio to him and said, well, then you're really driving that car because you look really good. That's a nice compliment. Back in fourth position, Jimmy Johnson. We told you the story. His first ever pole on a road course. He has never won on a road course. And right now trying to hold off the pressure coming from Montoya. Let's listen to the 48 radio. Loose, man. Almost spun out getting into 10. Hey, it's going to tighten up, man. It's going to tighten up. Same thing as this last time we were here. You're going to be fine. You don't want me to tell you what it's doing now? But I'm just trying to keep you in form, too. It's going to get tighter. You're doing great. Yeah, they're uh, kind of at odds a little bit about what the racetrack's doing. Jimmy says, you know, the car's loose, and Chad's saying it's going to tighten up. He says, well, you still want me to tell you what it's doing, right? And he <laughs> says, yeah, he does. He wants the information, but he just wants to make sure that Jimmy uh, knows, doesn't panic, that this, the track is going to change a little bit. Yeah, that's what you have to be careful of, and especially with the conditions that we have today being so much different than what we've seen uh, over the weekend, that you don't make too big of an adjustment there because, as he said, this racetrack is probably going to tighten up where their car is. Remember, these two guys were the principals at Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago. Montoya leading 116 laps, had the dominant car for the day, but made a mistake on pit road. It was Jimmy Johnson that went to victory lane. Debris in the inner loop. Well, we've got a caution. This is just a little bit before their pit windows. A lot of guys will probably uh, have a decision to make when they come around here for the opening of pit road. What would you do? I'd pit. Uh, I'd just come on in here and take a chance on it and see what happens. So the window, as you, by your calculations, would be lap 20. So we are two lap shot. So you'll go ahead and come in and roll the dice. Well, you, you know, you're going to have to count on getting a few more caution laps here to stretch all this out. But uh, 
when they fall right here at that pit window, especially when it's this close, you've got to consider making the stop right now. Yeah, the one thing it will do is put a lot of people on pit road probably at the same time. These pit boxes are really small, so you have to be careful. The caution was for debris on the racetrack. We'll take a quick break and come back and cover the first pit stop. This could be critical. Got to get it full of fuel and cannot speed. Under caution for the first time today here at Watkins Glen International. This is going to be critical, folks, because they are just outside their first fuel window, but it looks like most of the leaders will come on the pit road as they come around behind the pace car this time, and you got to get it full of fuel. Critical for these guys not only to get it full of fuel, but be able to get all the tires on and not make a mistake, and we're being told that we could have green next time by. Yeah, that's going to be a little tricky for these cars to get on pit road, make the pit stops, and get double file, but by the time we do get the green, so we'll be looking for the flagman here to see if we get the one to go signal while these cars are pitting. Thirty five miles an hour on pit road and Kurt Bush will lead the line down pit road. Let's go to Vince. The 47 of Marcos Ambrose did not come on pit road. There had been a debate. Marcos wanted to come because he's not happy with the car, but crew chief Frank Kerr urged him to stay out to get the clean air. That's what he's got. Jamie? It was a must for Tony Stewart in the 14 to pit. He said he's loose. He wants a spring rubber in both sides, a wedge adjustment on both sides, four tires and Sunoco fuel. He told the team he needs to do it now. He needs more drive off, so he told his crew chief exactly what he wanted. Shannon? Juan Pablo Montoya says the car is a little bit loose getting to the left they're going to make an air pressure adjustment on the left rear it is four tires for the 42 Dave second place Denny Hamlin is a little loose and a little tight track bar and air pressure adjustment for tires leader Kurt Busch his car was loose four tires he's going to win the race off pit road barely getting around Jimmy Johnson good job guys good job man Great job on pit road. You see Kyle Busch gaining the spots there. Biffle up, Montoya back too. Everybody putting on four tires. Paul Menard up five positions uh, on this exchange. Yeah, that's a great job by that 98 team. But we got a penalty coming for Denny Hamlin. Too fast exiting. Man, that's going to be a costly penalty right now. Also, the 88 Copy, car. Danny. Dale Jr. too fast on exit. See everybody getting kind of caught up in this race off of pit road and you see Denny Hamlin trying to get by the two just stood on the gas a little too hard in that last segment. OK guys uh, why did why did the 47 stay out 47 Ambrose stayed out Casey Kane and the 43 all stayed on the racetrack uh, your thoughts. Well I don't think I think it's a big mistake by both of these cars. I think it's going to put Mark Ambrose in a in a catch up position later in the race. It's really going to be tough for him to, to win this thing with this strategy. I know that they couldn't, that, you know, this was outside their window, but, uh, you know, you can count on the caution laps all the way from here to the end of the race to try to get there. Uh, you know, I, I would have gambled on this one. Yeah, sometimes it's important to stick with your strategy because that's what you want to do. But when the opportunity presents itself, as you just said, so close, then uh, can make a difference. Let's uh, talk to our in-race reporter here, Marcus Ambrose. Hey, Marcus Dale Jarrett, you have a copy? Yeah, for time. Uh, you're one of the three cars that decided to stay out. Was that your decision? Yeah, it's probably a joint decision. Uh, you know, we're just trying to run our own race here. We've got some changes we want to make to the car. We thought under caution, we may lose too many spots. We've got a fuel strategy game we're playing out here, and hopefully it'll work in our favor. Okay, uh, quickly, what is uh, what are you fighting with your car? Oh, uh, track's just green. Not a lot of grip out there, and I'm just filling up the cars on top of the racetrack. Haven't got very good forward drive. That's probably my biggest concern right now is forward drive. All right, buddy, good luck. So again, to set up what happened, we had three cars stay on the racetrack. Marcus Ambrose, Casey Kane, and Reed Sorensen, those three stayed on the track. We also had three drivers that are going to be penalized for too fast on exit. They will have a pass-through penalty. That is the 11 car of Denny Hamlin, the 88 of Dale Earnhardt Jr., and the 31 of Jeff Burton. All three of those cars will have to come in. Shannon. Guys, there's been an injury down here on pit road. Dwayne Ogle, the rear tire changer of the sixth car. The team has told me he was hit by the 42 car on pit road. He is favoring his right side right now, and the guys are tending to him. We'll follow this up. So if we can see the contact, there's Montoya leaving. Yeah, it gets tight down there. You see here. He does, oh, man. He does. He gets a piece of that front end on the 42 right here. Yeah, this is extremely tight pit road, and... Well, you see Montoya had the 16 car on his outside, so he was trying to cut it close, but, oh, man, cut it just a little bit too close. you got to be careful down there. Now, for the first time in Watkins Glen, the new rules, a double-file restart shootout style. 
Lead cars up front, side by side, coming down. It's Ambrose and Casey Kane. As the green flag comes back out, and we'll see uh, who will win that chase to turn one. These guys have to stay in, in line until they get across the start finish line once again. Well, look at Jimmy Johnson all the way down on the bottom of the race. Oh, That's oh, not going to work. Careful, guys. Man, Jimmy does a good Ooh. job right there not to make contact. Montoya off the track, and he Man, gets look back. how wide the track gets over there. They're using a lot of that runoff area. And those three drivers that uh, were speeding on pit road just had to go to the tail end of the longest line here uh, on this road course. So, so that's where uh, all of those guys had to restart. Yeah, they did not have to come down pit road and, uh, and get farther behind. Just starting at the back was a penalty. Kurt Busch in behind those two guys are the 9 and the 43, unable to get by. And the 47 just pulling away. And he got a big launch right there on the start. And uh, this is what he wanted. This is the reason he stayed out, is to get that clean air, see what his car will do out there. And uh, but I still think he's going to have to play catch up later in the race. Double foul restart can be helpful to some drivers because it pairs them up side by side. And that's uh, been a big, big help for that 24 car. Well, Jeff's able to make up some spots. Uh, they did a good job in the pits. It got him a lot closer to the front with the double foul restarts and a little aggressive driving on his part. Got him up there in a lot better position than when he went in the pits. Oh, and a little contact, a little chain reaction right here. Uh, 55 car around here. Yeah. Carpentier's car oh, spun around. Trying to get it started here. He's going to lose a lot of positions. Now he gets it going. We will stay green at Watkins Lynn. Jimmy Johnson again looking at the inside of Reed Sorensen. And Kyle Busch kind of opened up the door for Jimmy there, but he wasn't able to take advantage. I think his car is still a little bit on the loose side, especially on the fresh tires. Yeah, look for Jimmy Johnson to make a move down into the chicane under braking and try to get by Reed Sorensen. Right here he does. He goes, makes that move right here. This is a replay of this chain reaction. Yeah, this is all what's happening. You see David Streamy got into the 55 there. Yeah, as all of that was happening, let's look at the back of Jeff Gordon's car here. This is what happens. These guys had to slow up. Paul got Menard didn't get inside, slow. Inside. So tight Keep racing in turn 11. And while we were watching that, we mentioned Jimmy Johnson did get by the 43 of Reed Swords, and there's the 48 car of Johnson. Has moved uh, up into the fifth position and will set his sights on Kyle Busch. Let's listen in on the 42 of Juan Pablo Montoya. Did I hit somebody? Yeah, I'll get it. Sorry. Yes. Is the guy okay? I'll see. Uh, is the guy okay? They're checking right now. He, he looks all right. Sorry about that. I see Montoya concerned about the number six crew member here. I'm going to go get him checked out here. He's got some ice on his thigh. Hopefully, you know, his elbow, I see. Man, he's got, got a bandage on his elbow. Hopefully, he's going to be okay. Marcus Ambrose led the first lap in his Cup Series career last week at Pocono when he was uh, thought he was going to have a top 10 finish, got shuffled out there into contact with David Rudiman and Denny Hamlin, and now leading again three wide, headed toward the inner loop, and folks, that won't work even too wide. No, there goes Strammy through the grass. He's going around in front of these guys. Oh, man. Jeff Gordon gets a piece of it. So does uh, Kevin Harvey. 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 Got Carl Harvey Edwards right there into the side of Jeff Gordon. Stremme trying to get it fired, and we will have a full right course side, caution. Right side damage, rear damage on the screen here, Roy. Yeah, a lot of debris down there. They're going to have to clean it up. Guys, get ready to cut the bumper, cut the bumper cover off, and right front damage. The splitter is the splitter's broke. Yeah, Harvey got the worst of that. Boy, what a year it's been for Richard Childress Racing and Kevin Harvick outside the top 20 the in points. What are those guys doing? Yeah, sometimes you wonder that as a driver, just what, what was going on going there. The sheet metal for the right, for the left front fender. See okay. what happens. You see, Stremme gets off into the grass. That's never very good. Just loses total traction as he tries to come back onto the pavement, spins around in front of these guys. Casey Mir just snuck by. Gordon couldn't quite get by, and then Harvick into uh, the right front of David Stremme. Now watch Jeff Gordon's viewpoint here. Watch uh, Mears get by. So right here, you think Jeff Gordon's missed this, barely gets a little bit of contact, thinks he's okay, and then he gets hit by the 29. Right behind the right front wheel. Well, Carl Evers did a nice job to keep the nose of his car out of that uh, catch fence. Yeah, I thought he had gathered a part of this, but uh, he actually down, gets by down, right here and is able to come, on, come, on, come, come by on. without Just any damage right. to either side of his car. Stay in the middle here. 
See, Streamy was trying to make a pass there on Brian Vickers, and he just got, just miscalculated and got into the inner loop a little too fast and shot him through the grass. The two most heavily damaged cars, a 12 of Streamy and uh, the, the 29 of Harvick. Jeff Gordon got substantial damage there, too. Oh, we got a little, little more yeah. retaliation from an earlier accident. Yeah, that uh, came from when they were in turn 11, and Streamy got into the right rear quarter panel and spun uh, Carpentier out. Streamy now trying to get some serious repairs made on pit road. What a good weekend has been for him thus far. The great qualifying effort for this 12 car. Best of the year, fifth. And uh, there is the damage on the right front. Yeah, the looks, car looks pretty good from here. When we get a shot from that other side, you're going to see a whole lot of damage there on that right front all the way down the side of the car. And all those spots we were talking about that he made up there with good pit work and the double file restarts is going to be taken away because he's right got some side. work to if do. If they all pit, I want to change right sides only. If no one pits, I want to change four. I yeah, want you on pit road when it's open. The right rear is off. I think they're going to be okay. They get, get a little repair job done on this car. I think the car will be okay. It's just all those spots he's going to have to give up. Okay, and, any, and how about the 47 strategy now? What are they thinking? Now, they actually stayed out there longer than I thought they were going to. Yeah, they can go farther still. They can still go a few more laps, and I don't know if they'll pit under this caution. If they do, it's just going to be devastating. They're going to go back to uh, 35th or 6th. That's the problem with this strategy. I mean, you know, if, if Ambrose pits now, he's going to give up a ton of spots. Okay, now the, a lot of these guys are in the window. Now, if you're Frankie Kerr, what do you do? Do you go ahead and bring him in, or do you let him stay out there a little, little, well, little bit longer? At this point, I think I'd leave him out there because uh, a green flag pit stop might even lose him less spots. Uh, what, are, what are they thinking down there, Vince? That's exactly right, Andy, because uh, Frank Kerr says we're still not in our fuel window. He asked Marcos what he wanted to do, and Marcos said, well, we better stick with the game plan. You know, on that first set of sequences and the first set of pit stops, Marcos was really more in favor of coming to pit lane, and Frank was telling him, no, we need to stay out. So it's been interesting the debate back and forth between the two, but they're really a lot better in clean air, so they're sticking with the game plan and staying out front, not in the fuel window just yet for Ambrose. Well, Vince, we're going to get to see how this strategy works out between these two cars. We see the nine car, Casey Kane, on pit road and also uh, Sorensen. We'll see where they line up on this restart and then see where uh, where Ambrose winds up after he makes his stop. So it'll be a good way to gauge how the strategy works, but it's going to put these cars way back, Shannon. Strategy already playing out on pit road. Casey Kane in the nine. He's loose in. They're going to make a wedge adjustment. Four tires and air pressure for Casey Kane, guys. He went to victory lane at Sonoma, and they hope to do it again today. Guys? Yeah, 42 car, Juan Pablo Montoya, he pitted also. I can't hardly believe they did that after they made their other stop, but they're making a second pit stop. And let's uh, watch Mark Hollywood Armstrong, the rear tire changer for Robbie Gordon, go to work. Got the hood up here, got some kind of problem. See Hollywood working on the hood pin here. Don't know what kind of problem they have under there. Bobby Gordon, the winner here in 2003 and has had top five finishes here in three of the last five years, but having trouble here on lap 24 on pit road as they uh, are under the hood here of his Toyota. Okay, working on that screen area, the grill area. They have some rags out there. May have an oil line leak. What's wrong down there, Dave? Hey, I'm in the 39 pit right now, Andy, uh, with uh, Ryan Newman, who qualified six, a very fast race car, but almost immediately alternator problems. They're going to change the batteries during this pit stop. So troubles uh, starting to mount for some of the regulars here and some of the favorites. Ryan Newman in the pits. Remember, he's one of the guys in the top ten in points. Green flag waving here at the hell of a good at the Glen and Marcus Ambrose in the double file restart trying to hold off the outside challenge from Kurt Busch. Remember, Kurt made that pass on the opening lap on Jimmy Johnson. Good job by Ambrose to hold Kurt Busch off there. It looked like he had a nice run, but Ambrose stood hard in the gas and was able to stay out front. Now the question is, Ambrose is the only car in the field that has not been on pit road. How long can he stay out there? Yeah, that's, that's the thing. He can stay out there for a few more laps. He's a little bit light on fuel, but he does not have as fresh a tires as Kurt Busch behind him here. But we'll see how that balances out. I don't know if it's a question of how long he can stay out there, but how long will he stay out there? Yeah, from this point, it doesn't really matter. Uh, he probably should make this pit stop because uh, you know, if the caution comes out again, let's say right now, he'll have to make it under caution. He'll be back in 28th, uh, actually probably in the mid-30s. Let's listen to their radio. It's right to fly early here, Frank, so don't panic if uh, 
We didn't make the right choice there. We've got plenty of time. Hi, hey, buddy. Not panicking yet. No. I hope you're not. That was good. Kurt Busch trying to take the lead away with fresher tires in turn one, and uh, he look, makes it look easy. Almost. Well, Kurt Busch got a great race car. He showed that from the beginning, and he looks like he's really good on fresh tires. After they ran 10 or so laps, 10 or 12 laps, he started losing a little bit of time, but he's making it up here with these fresh tires. Yeah, it stretched it out far enough that losing a tenth or two or three in a lap, he had built up over a two-second lead, so that wasn't a problem. One of the road course specialists, Ron Fellows, that had been on pit road a moment ago in the 09 car, and they're going to push that car back to the garage area, so troubles for Fellows. A five-time winner here at uh, Watkins Glen and NASCAR, uh, NASCAR's other divisions. And Robbie Gordon is now one lap down after his problems on pit road. Actually, two laps down. Let's update the 09. Jamie. Well, the team's telling me that Ron Fellow's starter has broken. Remember, in the Nationwide Series, the one car, same team, they had an issue as well, and they lost quite a few laps. It's a bummer for the guy who's won here three times in the Nationwide Series, Doc. And he finished fifth here uh, in the Nationwide race on Saturday, but uh, troubles here for Fellows today. The caution just a moment ago on lap 22 involved three cars, a spinning David Strimmey. The two most heavily damaged cars were Strimmey and Kevin Harvick. Let's find out uh, what happened with Kevin Harvick and Jamie. Well, perhaps most severe damage was the 29 Kevin Harvick. You told me on Saturday how good this car was. What just happened? Uh, it looked like the 12 just drove through the grass and, and just, uh, I think, way over the means for how fast his car was. Obviously, he doesn't have the skill sets to continuously run the pace that he needs to run lap after lap and just uh, drove through the grass there. So uh, it's unfortunate for our guys on our Shell Pinswell Chevy and uh, just kind of got caught up in the wrong spot, wrong time. Kind of the story of the year, so wish it was over. Severe damage on the left front. Kevin, any chance to get back out? I hope not. <laughs> Kevin Harvick is out, guys. Well, you can hear the frustration. Yeah, for well, wow. Kevin Harvick out of it here at uh, Watkins Glen. Yeah, it looks like maybe uh, Marcus Ambrose is going to be coming to the pits this time. Watch and see the two car who's our leader. That is Kurt Busch. Up right, front. Nice and smooth right here. Nice and, and smooth. Uh, here comes a two car of Kurt Busch down pit road. Yeah, I don't quite understand this move. I think they actually pitted way early for a reason. They thought everybody would come to pit road and now they're in their window. Be the only thing I could think of. I guess we'll have to see how all this plays out, but 47 is still on the racetrack. The only guy that hasn't been to pit road. Let's Dave. Down the day. Hey guys, they were not going to take a chance on this being a, a two stop race only for them. They could not have made it. And so they're going to take on fuel now. They'll have to make one more stop after this. No tires changed on this, just full of Sunoco fuel for Kurt Busch. Almost stalls it, gets it fired, and uh, tiptoes off of pit road at 35. So we'll see how that plays out for him. Marcus Ambrose, meanwhile, re inherits the lead. And uh, again, if you just joined our coverage, Marcus Ambrose has not pitted. We are at lap 29. He'll be uh, finishing lap 30 this time by, and he has yet to come on pit road, although we are hearing that may happen this time by. Well, if you absolutely don't have the range to do it, you can't do it. So these guys are just having to pit when they can and when they know they can make it. But, uh, you know, the cars that can make it are going to have a huge advantage over these guys that are pitting now. And here comes Ambrose. Go down the vents. Marcos Ambrose making his first stop of the day. Remember, 35 miles per hour on pit road. They're going to take four tires and fuel only. The only thing Marcos has really complained about is that he just doesn't feel like he's had as much grip that he would like. So they make a small air pressure adjustment, hoping that the fresh rubber and the air pressure adjustment will help. The strategy has been the big question mark for the 47 of Ambrose. And right here, got to be very careful, Dale. Yeah, and this, this pit road goes downhill, so you really have to be careful and resist that temptation to get a little bit extra or even just the downhill taking your car. You have to be on top of it right here. That's agonizingly slow to watch him go down pit road. One thing he'll have, though, is he'll have some clear racetrack, and he can make good, good laps. Um, and if the caution comes out, then uh, he can catch back up. Yeah, that's the good thing about this strategy. You have nobody to contend with, so you can run some fast laps, and then as this whole thing cycles around, you've made faster laps than these guys that are back in there battling other cars. With Kurt Busch and Marcus Ambrose now pitting, it is Jimmy Johnson now the leader again. 
Kyle Busch second and guess who guys Superman at Watkins Glen Tony Stewart here he comes is in third position. Yeah no surprise here you know Tony did he didn't have the fastest car in practice but uh, he didn't need one in practice. <laughs> he can use it right now. I heard he was very comfortable with his race car very happy with what he had and felt like that uh, at the end of practice time that he was ready to uh, get himself up there and battle for a win. Greg Biffle is fourth good run for Biffle but look back in fifth spot here. Boris said having a great day here. He qualified in ninth position very solid and just slowly moving up. This team. They put a lot of effort into this and Boris looks uh, obviously he's very excited about coming here but uh, team showing a really good run here so far up in that fifth spot. We talked about uh, possibility of one of the road course experts possibly pulling off the upset. Look at the 13 car Mad Max Pappas driving uh, for Jermaine Racing. Look where he started and he's currently in the top 10 moving in uh, in eighth spot trying to take seventh away. He's had a solid car really all weekend long here and now he's having a great race making look like looking to the inside of McMurray thinks better of it. But look right behind him. You got Clint Boyer. He's running a good race also in the top 10. And our biggest mover and I think this is a great story Matt Kenseth who started at the back of the pack and has never had a top five finish on a road course in his career. Dave. Well, Doc, you can put yourself in position by strategy or you can do it by passing race cars. Now, Matt did not pass all those race cars on the track to do it, but his guys on pit road on that only pit stop got him seven positions. And during the David Stremme spin for our first caution, he went through the mess before the caution came out and picked up another six. So he's passed cars on the racetrack in several different ways, and that's how you put yourself back at least into contention. That's exactly what these guys needed to do, do their job. They do a great job on pit road week in and week out. And then Matt doing a solid job here on the racetrack. As these other guys pitted that last time, he was able to stay out there. Got himself up in 11th spot right now. Okay, here you see Marcus Ambrose just making after making his first pit stop. Now you're going to see the, a lot of the leaders are going to make their last pit stop here in the next five to three to five, six laps. They're going to make their last pit stop. And uh, Ambrose is still going to have to do the same thing. I really believe he has put himself in a big hole right here that he's going to have a hard time digging out of. What has to happen for him to maybe to climb back in this thing? Well, what's going to have to happen is a lot of cars that made that stop at lap 19 are going to have to make more than one more stop. That's what's going to, you know, that is what will help him. If if you have enough caution laps, though, from here to the end of the race, they, they will not have to make but one stop. Now, what about this guy here, Kurt Busch? Uh, now, he made that stop a lap before Ambrose. You see how far Ambrose is behind him. Yeah, Kurt Busch made his stop just a little sooner than than uh, Ambrose and also he did not take tires. He just got fuel. That's, that's right. That's the key. I think that he had to take that time to to put tires on. So gave him a little bit of an advantage there. But Mark Ambrose is running 35th, but he's running good lap times a 73 15 the last lap, which is virtually the same thing as Jimmy Johnson leading the race. 34 laps in the books and uh, right now the uh, top three cars. Well, how about a four time winner here? At Watkins Glen, that would be Tony Stewart back in third position. And Smoke has been so good at this place. Running second, last year's winner, Kyle Bush. And the guy's our leader, never won on a road course. The NASCAR Spring Cup Series at Watkins Glen International is brought to you by AT&T, your world delivered. And AMP, be one of thousands to get on the number 88. Sign up now at AMPEnergy.com. I don't have anything. I don't even have an ISO. There it is. There it is. Here at Watkins Glen, seventh lead change of the day. Our fifth different leader is the 18 car of Kyle Busch. These are the first laps Kyle has led since Daytona in July. And there's the battle for second spot to uh, Jimmy Johnson and Tony Stewart. Let's show you how Kyle got by the 48 car. It's going into uh, turn 11 here. See Jimmy's car still extremely loose for him. Kyle Busch able just to power up and had the preferred line as they head down into turn one. Left side here. Still left side. Corner still up here. And watch the 20 car, the rookie Joey Logano, right in front of Rudiman. Whew. Yeah, that's just trying to make that pass but carrying more speed than your car can handle. Lucky to have all that runoff area there so he didn't hit anything. He got it fired and got headed back around uh, well, and then we have stayed green. I want to correct one thing I said a while ago that the uh, leaders will make their pit stop. They're not going to make that pit stop for about 18 more laps. I thought I was looking at the wrong number on the monitor. Thought it was coming up sooner than it was. Here's the pressure. Tony Stewart. Put so much pressure on 
I think, I think Jimmy's still struggling quite a bit with his cards. You see Tony able to get pretty close. I don't know if he'll make a pass here. It looks like Jimmy might be in position to let him go. Nope, not ready to do that yet. I think Tony Stewart is in a position right now that he's just riding around this racetrack, biding his time. And as Andy said in early on, he's going to be a guy to contend with when it comes time. He's not going to show all his cards till it's time to put them on the table. Now, here's the two car of Kurt Busch. There's the interval. There's Kurt Busch. Remember, he came in and pitted on lap 29, and a lap later, Marcus Ambrose came in and pitted on lap 30. Now, there's Busch. Uh, you see Ambrose at the top of the screen just coming down the front straightaway. Now, when they pitted, or actually when Kurt Busch peeled off on lap 29, these cars were right together. Yeah, but there's, this is the difference in the two strategies. The two car pitted under that caution at, night, at lap 19, and then he just he took tires then. He comes down right here and only takes fuel, and it only takes a few seconds to top the thing off with fuel and get what they need. And then Ambrose comes around, and he is yet to make a pit stop, and he made a forward tire change under green, and now you see just how much difference that was on the track. Yeah, all the other times there you are fairly close except for that crew time. You can see five seconds to put fuel in and 16.9 for four tires of fuel. And that total time on pit road is where it really shows up. Marcus Ambrose has come back out running faster than Kirk Busch. Of course, he has the four tires now, but he's been able to cut down. He was a little over 11 seconds back of Kirk Busch. He's only eight seconds back right now. Well, let's update a couple other cars. We we're told the 77 car of Sam Hornish is overheating, having an overheating issue. There is Sam on the racetrack. Uh, after a car that was very good in practice uh, early in the week. And the, the 26 car, uh, Jamie McMurray, has gone to the garage area for a transmission problem. And let's see, uh, he could have gotten a grill full here. That may be uh, one of the uh, overheating issues. Yeah, it sure could. Uh, you get in that grass and it just stacks up right in that grill area. That's one of the negatives of this, you know, new car is in that splitter is that if you ever run off the racetrack, you're gonna just pack it full. Z has the leader on his bumper and here uh, Tony Stewart's taking over that second spot. Jamie? Well guys, Tony Stewart, he has come to life since his first pit stop. Remember, he started off pretty slow. He'd only gained one position because he was so loose. He came in and he acted as the crew chief. He told Darian Grubb exactly what he wanted in his car and Darian even said, are you sure you wanna put spring rubbers in and take that much time? Tony said, we have to. It was two spring rubbers, it was four tires. They made wedge adjustments on both sides. Guys, he has the grip, he has not said a word and he has gone straight to the front. Man, with his record here, I'd believe him too. I would. He said it. I'd do it anything he told that, me. Do you, Andy? <laughs> Whatever he said, that's what I would do. See, Sam Horn has now got some more problems. He's got Kyle Busch right on his bumper. Sam trying to stay on the lead lap. He currently being shown in 34th position as the last car on the lead lap. Carl Edwards uh, making a move inside of Elliott Sadler. And there, as you see, Juan Pablo Montoya right in front of him. Yeah, that's 11, 12th, and 13th on the racetrack. See Montoya there. He made a stop on the last caution to come in and get fuel to get themselves in their window. Just he just got a quick it. shot of fuel. He didn't lose near as many spots as some of the other cars did on that stop, but he's made up some on the track too. Shannon? Well, exactly. He restarted 24th, and now he has moved his way up. He is looking at the top 10 guys. Brian Patty told me this weekend they've been very happy with this car. While some teams brought their Sonoma cars here this weekend, they brought a brand new car. It was lighter for Juan Pablo Montoya, and it was just overall better. Right now, the handling is starting to go on this 42, but up until this point, they've only made one small air pressure adjustment as Juan Pablo Montoya looks to the inside and makes it around the 83 car. But Juan Pablo happy with the car so far. Well, it looks like he's handling pretty good right now. He's able to make these moves on, on at least these cars in this part of the running order. Now, one of the cars, we had three cars that were caught speeding on the exit of pit road and it started at the back of the longest line on the restart after they pitted on lap 19 was the 11 car of Denny Hamlin. There is the 11 of Hamlin, and he has worked his way all the way back up to 14th position. Yeah, and Jeff Burton's right behind him in the 15th spot, but a nice run for them. 
The other one that uh, had that penalty was Dale Jr. And he came back in the last time that we had a caution and topped his fuel off. So he should be ready to go for one more stop. Yeah, Dale Jr. now being shown in 25th spot, but all those cars on the lead lap and being able to gain some ground here. Watch uh, Hamlin try to make a move inside of Vickers. Yeah, there's no doubt he has one of the fastest race cars on the track, Andy. Yeah, he had the fastest car on the track uh, before that first caution. He was running Kurt Busch down by a couple three tenths a lap and then got nailed with that penalty. Just don't know how much has changed their strategy. They've had some things that will have a crash on the Ooh, track. Oh, hard, Junior. hard lick for Junior. And he is head first into the tire barrier. All the way across the gravel. We're done. Reed Sorensen involved in this wreck. Yeah, this is going to bring the caution out. Man, Junior, he stuffed that thing in the tires. Let's see if I can get out of here. See the steering wheel coming off the 88. Yeah, he's got the wind in that down to show the safety crews that he is okay. That car's nah, not okay. Lost the brakes. Lost the brakes. Oh, okay. Yeah. That you see right here. It. That's oh, what my. got Sorensen in trouble. Oh, that's, yeah. Sorensen. Junior just a victim here. And even all that sand and gravel can't slow a car down. They slowed it down. That's the yeah, key thing. That's it, right. still, it didn't keep it from hitting the wall, but definitely knocked a lot of speed off here. To, this could have been a really bad crash for Dale Jr. Had it not been for this area. This is what NASCAR and, and Watkins Glen have done to make it safer. We just got taken out, guys. Just got taken out by the 88. Yeah, well, it wasn't intentional. He just yeah, didn't have any way of slowing his car down. Reed Sorensen, wrong spot at the wrong time. That's Keith Barnwell, the spotter for the 43. And all he saw was 88 dive inside, and all of a sudden they're crashed. He didn't know why. And Dale Jr. had just hustled sure. that car back up in the 24th position after being on pit road. And, uh, wow, there's no brakes. And, DJ, I mean, there's not much more you can do, I mean, with regard to coming in there at that speed. Well, it's just, yeah, you try to make a right, rolling, guys. terribly bad situation uh, uh, as good as you possibly can. As you can see, Reed Sorensen here, he's rolling. He's trying to drive around this gravel pit, get himself back on the racetrack. He's going to be able to do that now as he goes through the mud. See Junior trying to run over there and tell him maybe uh, yeah. didn't mean to, guy. Just ran out of brakes. Under caution now for the third time today here at Watkins Glen. <laughs> 